This one here survived the wreck. Sure looks like it. For years, Skull and Bones was assumed to be a ghost ship, the Ubisoft pirate game that would never make it to harbour. Having suffered six public delays, it is one of the most frequently postponed games of all time. The near-total silence that surrounded it year after year convinced people that it was either permanently anchored at the port of development hell, or that it had already sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Each new delay prompted the same question. What on earth was happening inside Ubisoft Singapore? The answer was hundreds of developers navigating a storm of design problems in hunt of their white whale. So we could not really reboot the game. This didn't feel quite Right. We wanted to expand. The narrative is, hey, when is this game launching? Now, almost seven years since it was first revealed, Skull and Bones is ready to set sail. But this final version is very different to the game we first saw in 2017. Across its development journey, the naval battler has changed forms multiple times, with its final design emerging from a major reboot that prolonged development and left several prototypes shipwrecked. There's always things that you can salvage. They got a lot bigger. This studio knows how to ship trip play games. This is the inside story of Skull and Bones' many delays and the challenges that caused them. In Skull and Bones, the Indian Ocean is your playground. You're free to explore its open world and hunt down the food and materials you need to survive in the golden age of piracy. You can take on contracts that build your infamy and push you towards the ultimate goal of becoming a fearsome pirate kingpin. Its story is minimalist, promoting your own adventures and the self-made tales of the other players that also sail these online seas. But Skull and Bones wasn't always this live service open world survival game. In fact, Skull and Bones has been multiple different games or at least ideas for games, before it became what it is today. Our story starts in 2017, when Ubisoft revealed a brand new pirate game at its annual E3 conference. The presentation was led by creative director Justin Farron, a member of Ubisoft's Singapore studio and a veteran producer of Assassin's Creed since the days of Black Flag. Skull and Bones takes place in a shared systemic world, where you can sail solo or form a gang of pirates with your friends, and together, terrorize the trade routes of the Indian Ocean. But that shared world was not what Ubisoft showed in its gameplay demonstration. And it was more like a hero arena shooter, but with ships. It was a 5v5 uh, arena-based multiplayer. Known as Loot Hunt, this multiplayer mode seemed to be a naval-themed take on hero shooters like Rainbow Six Siege and Overwatch, rather than the sort of seafaring MMO that Farron had described. But Ubisoft assured that Skull and Bones would be bigger than what we'd seen. It would have a shared world, seasonal content, and a narrative campaign that would flow into the multiplayer experience. Our campaign is actually integrated into the experience in our PvE and our PvP. I see. So players, again, they start as a as a you know an upstart captain. They work their way up. Um, yeah, I mean, narrative is important. All of this, Ubisoft said, would launch in the fall of 2018. One year later, just weeks before E3 2018, Skull and Bones was pushed back until at least 2019. Despite the delay, it was still part of Ubisoft's E3 conference, and it looked radically different to how it did in 2017. Rather than 5v5 multiplayer, the new demo showcased a cooperative game in which players teamed up to take down a powerful enemy warship. Was this the shared world that had been promised the previous year? Or had Skull and Bones morphed into a different game entirely? We like to see it as a, an evolution of the game. Not a different game necessarily, but we wanted to expand. We knew we had something great, it was feeling great, it was looking great, but why don't we offer more? Why don't we have a more variety in gameplay and bring back that exploration that was very popular in Black Flag? We wanted to do the biggest pirate naval open world game we could do. As E3 2018 drew to a close, few people would have anticipated the four years they would have to wait until they saw Skull and Bones again. The following year, it was delayed until sometime after March 2020, and Ubisoft's E3 2019 conference went ahead without even a single new screenshot. Just months later, a third delay was announced. In 2020, Ubisoft revealed that the studio had found a new vision, which subsequently led to a fourth delay. As the years and delays went by, not a single thing was seen of Skull and Bones. 
In July 2021, the long silence was broken, but not by Ubisoft. A damning report from Kotaku painted a picture of a studio in chaos. It claimed that over the course of eight years, Skull and Bones had been helmed by three different creative directors, each of which worked to different documents, meaning that many concepts, including an Assassin's Creed spin-off and the modes we'd seen at E3, had been scrapped in favour of building different designs. Anonymous interviews with current and former developers suggested that the project was a mismanaged nightmare lacking direction. It was a report that raised dozens of questions, but the biggest of them was the simplest. What on earth was happening inside Ubisoft Singapore? studios contributed to every Assassin's Creed title since AC2. This studio knows how to ship AAA games, and that's why we got the opportunity to, to lead on Skull & Bones. Ubisoft Singapore started life in 2008 as a small support studio. Over the years, it has grown from a handful of people to a few hundred staff, working on games such as Prince of Persia and Ghost Recon. Its most famous creation, though, is Assassin's Creed 3's naval combat, which went on to form the foundations of Black Flag. With that series-defining success, the Singapore team saw a new and exciting future for themselves. They wanted to be more than a support studio. They wanted to take naval combat to the next level and create an original game of their own. But making a great game is far from an easy task, particularly when it's your first time as a lead developer. There's nothing in the video game industry that's harder than building a new IP. You think you know what the game is, but you're really discovering in many ways as you go and finding out what resonates with your players. You're trying to find the recipe, you're trying to find that core gameplay loop, you're trying to find what the IP is when you're making something new. Not everything makes it, but you learn from all the things that don't make it and hope that what's left is, is the best it can be. It's just, it's a journey, it's a process of, of iteration. Creating a new game is difficult, but it's even more of a challenge without leadership. In late 2018, creative director Justin Farron was making preparations to depart Ubisoft Singapore. He would leave the following summer. But the need for a new creative director raised questions about more than just leadership. What was this game's identity? Was it a PvP multiplayer arena or a co-op open world? Was it a narrative campaign or a live service game? If Skull & Bones was to survive this development storm, it needed help. The search was on for a new captain. The current direction of the game really started to take shape when Elizabeth Pellin joined as creative director, which I was to believe was about three years-ish ago. The vision that Elizabeth, our creative director, came in with was very clear. I mean, it was taking what was the original Skull and Bones, the 5v5 shooter, and turning it into an open world game where players can choose the way they're going to experience the world and, and really become their own pirate. Ubisoft knew that Skull & Bones was in need of an experienced, steady hand. That seniority was found in Elizabeth Pellin, a 20-year-plus Ubisoft veteran and vice president of its editorial team. Pellin had significant experience in directing games with online features, and so it was believed she was ideally suited to a project attempting to work out its own multiplayer identity. At the end of 2018, Ubisoft was looking for someone who uh, was familiar with the uh, processes of creating a new IP. They were also looking for someone to help the Skull and Bones to turn the most promising prototypes and demo into a full uh, game uh, experience. Prototypes, demos. Despite having initially planned for a 2018 release, Skull and Bones was still in the prototyping phase by the end of that year. And while the open world had been showcased at E3 that summer, internally, Skull and Bones was still a small-scale versus game. At that time, the game was a 5 versus 5 PvP arena. The 5 versus 5 was fun to play, but sometimes it was also difficult for the player to maneuver inside an arena with such big uh, ships. Because the ships didn't have a lot of customizable uh, options, it was difficult for us to project on the long term, while on the open world, the game experience had more potentials. But that potential was still in its early stages. Despite having been discussed as part of the initial reveal, the open world still didn't exist beyond the demo built for E3 2018. So far, it was just a taste of what Ubisoft Singapore hopes Skull & Bones would one day become. 
The chunk of open world was a 15-minute demo that did showcase different classes of ship. It was not yet an entire open world. They tried to develop the, the PvP arena and the open world in parallel, but it was a little bit challenging for the team because it was the first time that most of the talents had the opportunity to create their own IP. We thought that it would be safer and maybe more interesting for the players also to fully focus on the open world. If Skull and Bones was to succeed, the Ubisoft Singapore team would first need to find its focus. On Pelin's advice, all staff would move to the open world design and build that up from a demo into a full game. Any other idea the team wasn't fully capable of building in parallel would be cancelled, and so the 5v5 mode was abandoned. A third mode, the previously promised narrative single-player campaign, was also in development, and that would also need to be scrapped. It was a little bit challenging for the team because it was their, their first IP. And uh, building a solo campaign is really time consuming. We didn't have the full team to deliver a full solo campaign. Beyond the issues with development of the game itself, Pelin also saw that the studio was in need of someone experienced in building and launching a complete original game. The studio was a little bit uh, isolated also from uh, the other studios and from the HQ. And since I had spent some time on both the production side and also the editorial side, I thought that, that I would be maybe gr a great addition to the project to help them with the editorial expectations and also to help them to go through the different milestones required to, uh, to ship a game. With Pelin as the ship's new captain, Skull and Bones would finally find its true heading, the new vision that Ubisoft would later announce in 2020. But why a new vision? Why, after years of development, old visions and little genuine progress, did Ubisoft not just cancel the entire project? Why were staff not reassigned to other games? That's a question I'm sure many people have, is why has this game continued for so long? I think that in many other companies, maybe it wouldn't have survived as long as it has. Ubisoft supports projects they believe in, teams they believe in. I firmly believe that they, they knew that there was something with this. This didn't feel quite right, but they wanted to see what they could do, so they asked a very experienced creative to come in and take a look at how she could influence the project and take it in that direction, which is what has happened. There was, apparently, another factor too. Kotaku's report claimed that the studio made a deal with the local government that requires Ubisoft Singapore to launch an original game within the next few years. In short, the studio may be legally required to deliver Skull and Bones. When IGN asked if this is true, Ubisoft declined to comment. Regardless of the details keeping it in development, one thing was clear – Skull and Bones needed reworking. It needed to leave its campaign and 5v5 mode behind and fully focus on the shared open world that it had promised. And so Pelham moved to Singapore and took over as creative director, ready to rally the team around a new vision. I arrived on the project with one simple question is how do you become a pirate? What did blow my, my mind? At that time, all those legendary pirates in Indian Ocean started with almost nothing to become the rock stars of the 17th century. They had to face unpredictable storms, they had to survive to mutinies, to shark attacks, and uh, sometimes uh, starvations. Suddenly, for me, it made this fantasy more relatable because it means that anyone could become a pirate. The idea of that journey became the foundation for Pelin's vision, a live service open world game all about survival. This new version of Skull and Bones would feature resource gathering, trading, and crafting. A deep progression system would chart your rise from a nobody to a notorious kingpin. If it was a key part of the dangerous life of a pirate, Pelham wanted it in the game. My mandate was to deliver an authentic pirate experience within a, a deep multiplayer uh, open world. So the first objective was to develop a vast, uh, fully seamless open world dedicated to generate uh, emergent uh, content, but also to provide several activities to both solo, PV and PvP players. Then the second big step we took is to break down our ships, but also the captain pirate role in to different layers of progressions. The third pillar we worked on was the narrative. So we really wanted to give the opportunity to the player to write their own story. So instead of working on a solo campaign, that would have prevented the team to really create a, a deep uh, op open world. We built a lore 
that can be consumed like a puzzle in the order you want. Those are really the three pillars we work on to capitalize on the existing naval combat system to bring it to the next level. Palin's vision was effectively a reboot that refocused the team back to its original promise of a shared systemic world. But where a reboot at Ubisoft would typically see a team reduced down to its core creatives and then slowly built back up as the game took form, Ubisoft Singapore was unable to do that. All the new IPs at Ubisoft went through one or two reboots. In the case of Skull and Bones, we could not really reboot the game because we could not ram down the team. So we had to continue, we had to make some adjustments, but to continue to work with 500 people. In Montreal, it's easy also to transfer some people or to offer them the opportunity to uh, work for a while on another game before to go back to the initial title they, they are started. And in Singapore, it, it was not possible uh, uh, at that time for se several reasons. So. Uh, we had to, 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 to work with this, uh, this big team. But the development team faced that challenge head on. By building the new vision around the core naval combat systems that the studio had already crafted for 5v5 multiplayer, they ensured that Skull and Bones did not have to be started again from scratch. Much of the team's previous hard work would not be lost. And there's always things that you can salvage. A reboot is never a total reboot. So the navigation, how the ship felt, all of those things was even in the game you saw before, they always, they felt good, they were pretty good. But how do we bring that into a progressive system for the player? How do we have more depth to that combat, not just a more arcadey, you know, cannons go boom type of gameplay. So all of that needed to be introduced. It got a lot bigger and technically it got a lot more complex. Of course, it means that some things need to be reworked, some things need to be changed and timelines adjusted. And, you know, it, it is part of the reason why we need more time. If we have these cool ideas, we want to add to the scope, add to the vision. So your deeds grows louder. Rallied around this new survival vision, the Singapore team geared up into full development. And by July 2022, four years after its last public showing, Ubisoft was confident enough in Skull and Bones to reveal its new form to the world. Welcome to Skull and Bones. Our game takes place during the golden age of piracy, in a world inspired by the beautiful yet dangerous Indian Ocean. But rather than being met by unanimous applause, the re-reveal was greeted by cautious skepticism and mixed feelings from the gaming community. Of course, we, we are a little bit sad that some players expected the Assassin's Creed Black Flag 2. Since the beginning of this reboot, we collaborated with players who were uh, inside our programs. We did a lot of playtests also to be sure that the processes of creation uh, will follow players' uh, expectations. The best feedback, of course, comes when players have actually been able to play the game. And that was planned to be soon. The re-reveal came with the first solid release date, November 8, 2022. In less than half a year, the team work would finally be in players' hands. Three months later, Ubisoft delayed Skull and Bones for the fifth time. Three months after that, Ubisoft delayed Skull and Bones for the sixth time. Six delays across six years. Few games have suffered as many publicly announced postponements as Skull and Bones. It's a situation that's damaged the game's reputation, turning it into the butt of many internet jokes. But the re-reveal proved that Skull and Bones was still alive. Not just alive, but apparently on track. Almost ready, even. So, what happened? Skull and Bones early years saw the studio struggle to find the right design framework. That accounts for the first delay. But while the team was put on the right path when Elizabeth Pellon joined in 2019, the journey towards her survival-focused vision could not be finished within the initially planned timeline. The next four delays were the result of numerous design struggles, from technology shifts to simply ensuring the game was fun enough for players. The particularity of Skull and Bones is that uh, our entire world is a, is a social hub. So it's a full uh, seamless PV and PvP experience supported also by PvE server, it did require for a lot of talents to work outside of their comfort zone. When you build a seamless world dedicated to generate emergent content, you have to accept that a part of the content will uh, escape to your control. It's so difficult to control the player experience that took us some while also. Just like a proper pirate would. 
we had to involve partner studios to gather different pieces of content and put them together and aggregate them into a world it took some time. And the more systemic is the game, the more bugs you, uh, you have to fix uh, uh, as well. Further complicating things was the release of the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series consoles. The increased power of these machines was naturally a boon for an open world filled to the horizon with technologically advanced water technology, and so the decision was made to make Skull and Bones a new generation exclusive. The process to convert the game from old to new gen took almost six months. But complex work and shifting timelines weren't the only issues endured by development staff. In the summer of 2020, the Singapore studio was caught up in the wave of allegations facing Ubisoft regarding workplace toxicity, harassment and misconduct. Following an investigation, managing director Hugh Ricoeur was removed from his position in November 2020 in response to unacceptable behaviour. Ricoeur was reassigned to Ubisoft's Paris HQ and replaced by Daryl Long who moved to Singapore in March 2021. Ubisoft Singapore's managerial issues appear to extend beyond just Recall, though. Posting to company review website Glassdoor, former staff have criticised studio management for lack of direction and incompetence. Talking to Kotaku, one former developer said, the toxic culture permeating the Singapore studio is in no small part responsible for most of the production issues, reboots, rebrands and re-reboots that have plagued Skull and Bones for a decade. When asked if management had struggled to handle the project, a Ubisoft spokesperson said, The well-being of our teams is our first priority, and we are committed to continually improving our workplace and production policies and processes to ensure we're offering a healthy work environment for all our teams. With regards to improving conditions during the rush to finalise a project, we have taken steps to manage this by implementing tools to facilitate more efficient project management, working closer with quality control teams early in development, and integrating more checkpoints during production to be better prepared for launch. In the Singapore studio, we have put in place flexible work policies and adapted benefits to support a healthy work-life balance. We also have in place an employee wellness team and are proud to have seen their work being recognised by several industry awards for their efforts in promoting mental and physical health. This is an ongoing process and we must continue to be agile in order to build a better work environment for all our teams. Our teams are fully focused and motivated to create great experiences for our players. With so many development complications and pressures, delays have become a fact of life for Ubisoft Singapore's developers. To work for so many years on a seemingly never-ending project can sometimes be discouraging, and so looking after the team's mental health has been important. There is an impact, you know, we're working really hard and of course we want people to experience and play what we're working on, but I think it's important, I know I think many of us feel this way, is not to be so end goal driven. We accept that uh, the delay means more time to make a better game. It's a tough one, right? You're going to have times where deadlines change, where you shift in direction and you need to push things. So it's really about making sure that that the team sees it as not a negative thing, right? Because it, it almost never is. So really, it's about team health. How do we make sure that the team understands why and what we want to accomplish with that extra time? And a great example of a feature that, that did get added later on in the development is the infamy system. In many ways, that's one of the central pillars of the game is the idea you're becoming this infamous pirate. But building that into something that players can, can progress their own way. And that's something that we saw as we went that was a great opportunity to enhance the experience and the fantasy of being a pirate. Alongside those delays, the project has also seen a rotation of senior staff. When it was announced in 2017, Bill Money was Skull and Bones game director, but he soon moved on to Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Associate game director Antoine Henri also moved on to Assassin's Creed Valhalla in 2018, only to rejoin Skull and Bones in 2021 and then leave by the end of that December. Senior game director Ryan Barnard, who joined in 2021, would only stay with the studio until spring 2023. Creative director Justin Farron was replaced by Elizabeth Pellon, who has also since left the project, although Ubisoft says her creative duties are now complete. 
The result of these staff changes is that, in the final months of pre-release development, Skull & Bones has been captained by relative newcomers, with its senior producer and game director having joined the studio in 2022. Regardless of their experience though, they're still eager to deliver something special. The benefit for me coming in at the end was fresh eyes. The second thing was that I don't have to be trying or prototyping some things if that's been explored before. There's a lot of responsibility I think that we as a team have. The narrative is hey, when is this game launching? When I showed up here immediately, like, when are we going live? Ubisoft has finally settled on a final release date for Skull & Bones, February 16, 2024. 15 months and two delays later than its previously planned November 2022 launch. At the end of the day, the, the game wasn't where the company wanted it to be. The last you know 12 to 18 months has been doubling down on the things that are great about this game. That required more time, that required more public facing tests, more technical tests, more deep diving into the nuances of core and naval combat and, and co-op and some of these other these other things that are that are big parts of the, the product offering. We made improvements to like, you know, what we call the ship archetypes now to define the roles, you know, to fit better the multiplayer situation. So we kind of push the extremes a bit to let players know now, like we do have archetypes in the game. We do have DPS, we do have tanks, we do have support, right? The first beta that we had really, I think, set the tone for belief. Belief in the product, belief in what we were offering it was fun, it was cool, it was engaging, but also it gave us a lot of valuable feedback on areas that we could improve. As a result of that, we've added a first mate, for example, to your ship. Pretty, huh? One thing that came up a lot, I would say like boarding is only a cutscene, so we kind of acted upon it. Boarding is now using grappling hooks. You need to aim, you need to understand, you need to have a feeling of range. It's no longer as straightforward as just pressing a button. As you've seen in the last close beta, we have sea monsters and ghost ships now, right? It's really, you know, finding what is cool for the players in terms of pirate fantasy to add to the game. Removing the constraints of historical accuracy, I think really excited the team quite a bit. We are investing in, in naval combat in a space that's inspired by 17th century Indian Ocean piracy, what we call the, the golden age of piracy. But it's really fun to be able to say like, okay, well, what's our next sea monster that we're working on? How is the ghost ship moving forward from here? What gameplay can we bring? I think the more that we focused on the fun, the more that we focused on what was cool, I think the game then really took on a life of its own. That's put us now on the path to be able to, in a very public way at the Game Awards, say, you know what, we are ready. We feel like we've, we've accomplished what we were trying to do over the last couple months. It's time to get out there and go live. For close to a decade, Ubisoft Singapore has been building and rebuilding Skull & Bones. The team, both long-serving veterans and recent recruits, have been through a lot, but they finally made it to the harbour. I think it's amazing the, the amount of resilience that they've shown and the changes in direction that we've talked about also. I mean, these are things that the team has adjusted as they go and said, we're not giving up. We're going to ship this game and we're going to make it great. And, you know, I'm really proud of what this team has done and they should be very proud of themselves as well, bringing this game to completion. It was not easy to create great synergy between the navigation and the aiming system, but they succeeded to, to do it. We developed it in a huge open world. I think it's the biggest uh, open world that uh, Ubisoft ever created. And now this open world offers a lot of opportunity to develop new activities, uh, new narrative layers. It's like we planted a lot of seeds and that are exciting to, ex exciting to, you know, to, to grow now. But the journey doesn't end here. In many ways, it's just the beginning. All of that hard work was in service of creating a live service game that will continue to evolve. And so now development begins on DLC, seasonal content, and the future of Skull and Bones. The seasons will have themes. That's where we may introduce new enemy types, new factions, some of the things we talked about, maybe more fantastical enemies. It's also where we can react to the community and bring in new elements that maybe they've been asking for that we didn't think of. You know, Ubisoft has already committed to this game for years in the future. With those seasonal ambitions, Ubisoft Singapore hopes that Skull & Bones is here to stay, and that players will find something to cherish among its lovingly created digital waves. 
I think players will find their, their own story in the game. If after they've played the game for five years, they'll look back and they'll say like, I was the one defining what it means to be an infamous pirate. And I got to tell my own story. Maybe at some point they're, they're ranked at the top of the world and they'll be able to look back and say, I was the most infamous pirate in the world. I can't think of anything cooler than that. Becoming the home for a passionate community of online pirates is the ultimate goal for Skull and Bones. But regardless of its eventual success, and despite the difficulties faced by staff, the journey to this point has been something important for Ubisoft Singapore. I do feel like Skull and Bones will be part of us for a long time. It's our first led AAA studio coming out of Singapore. Yeah, I hope we don't forget about that. We should be proud of that. <laughs> One huge reboot, three release dates, six delays. Skull and Bones' journey across the development waters has been far from easy. Idea after idea had to be jettisoned and thrown away. High-profile departures and scandal rocked the studio. But the dedication of the development team helped see the project through even the darkest days. Over many years, Skull and Bones has been many things, but its final form is now ready to set sail. And that final form is, surprisingly, the one promised in its very first public appearance, a shared, systemic world in which players strive to become the ultimate pirate kingpin. But it's a form that means that what Skull and Bones is today is likely not what it will be tomorrow. Its evolutionary cycle now begins anew, the design shifting and changing as Ubisoft Singapore reacts not just to the demands of its management, but its players too. It's a destiny that's fitting of a game that's constantly changed since its inception. What will remain constant is the story. The story of a development team who endured everything in effort to bring their first complete, original game to life. Whatever that game was, whatever that game is, and whatever that game may be, The Legend of Skull and Bones will long be as famous as the black and white flag its pirates fly. Say, were you ever in old St. Anne? St. Anne, old St. Anne. Eat what you find and you drink what you can. Only in old St. Anne.